Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television, and theater. And today we are joined by the fantastic director of Supervillain, the making of Takashi 69, Karim Gill. And the first thing I was interested in is that you have been very outward about the fact that at first you weren't necessarily interested in making a story about Takashi and, and exploring him as a documentary subject, but then you found interest in the wider conversation that this mm -hmm. offered the opportunity to have. So what were those early conversations with the producers behind the film as well in, in finding the fact that there actually was a narrative thread that you were really interested in exploring? Right. So, so um, yeah, a little bit of background about kind of the origin of this, this whole thing. Um, so the project is actually based on the Rolling Stone article, um, the rise and fall of hip hop's first supervillain. Um, and so imagine uh, Lightbox and Rolling Stone kind of all got together. Um, and then I was asked to do the project night, like, like you just mentioned, I, I was a little bit turned off because he's not exactly the most deserving of a music documentary. Um, and after a while, I was kind of seeing everything that was happening in the world during the time that I was evaluating whether or not this is something for me. And I was seeing, you know, a lot of things that Trump was doing online. I was seeing a lot of things that was, were happening in our culture, you know, like films like The Joker were coming out, which were taking villains and, and monsters of society and like deconstructing them and really like making it, taking a look at why, like what exists in our society to, to, to lead to this. And I think for me, just having a conversation with, with Vinny and Zoe at Showtime, as well as our partners, um, and imagine Rolling Stone and Lightbox and everyone being really really receptive to the fact that I didn't want to make a music documentary about Scotch 6 9 And I said that from the beginning and I, I this is not a music documentary about Scotch 6 9 I think they were really, really open to that and supportive. So that's kind of like how it all came to be where it's at now. Um, does that kind of make sense? It does. Yeah. And, you know, obviously within that fact, he's actually not an active participant himself right. within the documentary. Were there ever conversations about going to him and asking him to do anything? Or you were always explicit that you wanted to tell the story about him using his social media, using interviews, but not necessarily with him as a subject? Yeah, th there were conversations as there are for, you know, anytime you're doing a project with any high profile individual in the culture, right? It's like, should we interview that person? And my, my perspective always, you know, and, you know, the whole team had different perspectives on it. You know, some people thought it was good, some people it wasn't. Mine was, I, I don't see the, the purpose of, of interviewing him, right? I think the question I would always ask is, if you were doing the Donald Trump documentary, would you interview Donald Trump? Would you sit down with Donald Trump? I, I don't know if you would, because I think once you sit down with these figures, there's going to be one, there's going to want to be an element of control over the narrative, naturally. And, you know, I think a lot of these stories can be told without that. I think there's, there's an element of objectivity that's preserved like journalistic integrity that's preserved when you are able to comment on it the way you want to comment on it without having to worry about, you know, what is he going to want to cut out or not cut out? You know what I mean? So I, I was a big fan of not interviewing him. And I think that was the right decision because it's not about him. It's about so much more, you know, he's a symptom of our culture. Yeah. You know, and, and going beyond the scope that you would have with a narrative sorry, with a documentary feature, um, you've, you're telling this in three episodes, which gives you a little bit more freedom in terms of the time that you have to explore the story, but then also at the same time, it is three episodes. So there are constrictions still. What did you find were the things with that length that you really felt like you had the time to like dive much more in depth into, but then where were the moments where you had to make decisions about, is this really necessary to be a central focus of, of the series? Yeah, I think, um... Yeah, I think being able to do this in a serious format really just allowed um, there to be so many adjacent conversations to the Takashi narrative, which is exactly what I wanted to do. Like, I don't know, I would have been able to explore that or I would have done it if it was a feature. Like if, if I was constricted to a feature length or a feature structure, I don't know if it would have been right for me because what I wanted to do the whole time was map out his storyline and then look at the different cultural conversations that can spark from his narrative, right? So. For example, in episode one, when we're when we're seeing him kind of transform from this normal little kid to the social media villain and monster, I think there's a there, there was a really interesting point of conversation around that this 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 idea of doing anything that you can on your platform because everyone has their own platform now. It's a common idea, right? So, like all these little things that I've always found interesting as a 26 year old, right, growing up with social media. I was able to explore that in three episodes because the, it was it was so segmented, you know.
Yeah. You know, and obviously a huge thread in it is the fact that he projects a very different narrative to what the truth is at a, at a lot of times. So how much, how much did you actually know about what the truth was versus what he put out publicly when you went into it? And what did you discover along the way that was a little bit different? Yeah. I mean, we, we had an amazing team, you know, the entire production team was incredible from the show and our Pete Scalatar down. And I think one of the things that we were able to do is really pull court documents and pull a lot of, you know, classified things through different relationships that everybody had and, and, and really kind of take a look at the overall picture of this guy. And then a lot of the work that we did was, um, you know, a lot of, before anybody sat down for, not for everybody, before a lot of the people, before a lot of the people sat down for interviews, we were having, you know, Pete and I, the showrunner, we were having conversations with them, like meeting with them in New York before the pandemic, having drinks, grabbing lunch, like, being a human right so like when you're able to do that you're able to formulate an objective perspective where a lot of times some people had good things to say about him, other people had bad things to say about him and i think that was kind of the, what allowed us to really kind of shape who this person was mm -hmm. and within the subjects that you interview you know there are, like you said there are people that have good things to say about him you know every human is complex but also there are people in the film that have you know been a little bit damaged by him emotionally or even physically mm -hmm. you know with his with his ex-partner and the mother of his child who he was right. physically abusive towards what were those early conversations with them as potential subjects in in terms of what what they wanted to know about how you were going to tell this story and how you were going to approach the conversations that you were going to have with them on camera I think I think naturally everybody was very traumatized by what they've gone through with him and I think especially the mother of his children and longtime girlfriend for I think upwards of multiple years I mean she was very traumatized and people don't want to speak you know what I mean like so I think a lot of it was one earning that trust and I think that trust was earned from us because there's been other projects that have you know they these subjects have felt exploited by um in different formats where, the, where you know there's been a bunch of stuff around this guy and I think for us it was about being like look this is not we're not trying to exploit this for a quick you know shock factor story like the purpose of this and we were saying it from the beginning was is to take this guy's story and create a cautionary tale that explains to everybody how somebody can go and become a manufactured supervillain monster. And what does that say about our society at large? And I think that with that being the overall approach, a lot of these subjects, whether they were, you know, gang members, former gang members, close partners, whatever, were actually really receptive. They're like, that's, you know, a refreshing take. We don't want to, they didn't want to be exploited and we didn't want to do that. There was never it was never like, let's make a shock factor project that everyone's going to watch because it's such a ridiculous story. It was always like, let's make something that can shine some light on some really dark and real shit and that's happening in our culture. Yeah. And there's obviously a necessary sensitivity, even when you're in the room filming some of these conversations, you know, yeah. when, when Sarah's talking about the experience that she went through, um, what, what was the type of space and environment that you really made sure that you created on set for her to feel comfortable in those moments when you were taping that with her? Yeah, I mean, and I, and I do this with, with all the projects that I do interviewing, whether it's high profile, you know, artists, celebrities, icons, or if it's, you know, people who have really, you know, deeply emotional stories, uh, whatever it is, I, I like to clear the room entirely, except for bare essentials. So it's really just a one to one conversation. Um, so in Sarah's particular interview, everybody was, you know, in a different room, you know, and watching and taking notes in their own space. And what I, what I did was I, it was just me and my camera, I think it was two camera cam, people on camera and, a, and our sound guy, um, but really creating an intimate space where you're allowed to speak, right? And, and my approach is having a conversation. It wasn't question, 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 question. It was like, I felt the Sarah interview was upwards of like three or four hours, I'm pretty sure. I think it was upwards of four hours and we broke it up. I think we stopped halfway, but, but the, the, it was a real conversation. Like we're about the same age, you know, we've experienced this transformation through social media. We've experienced this world change in front of our very eyes. And I think there was an element of like connection that we had when we spoke. Right. And I think when you eliminate all of the producers and people in the room, not that they're bad people, it's just more people. Right. When you eliminate that and create intimate space, it actually allows people to be vulnerable and, and connect. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. And then one of the challenges in then taking all of these interviews into post-production is, is finding the commonality and the threads which really tie those moments together, particularly when you've got several hours with, with each person. So what was that mm-hmm. journey of going into the post-production process with these interviews and really finding those narrative arcs within the stories that they're telling? Because there's moments where they're telling stories about the same moment or the same instance, but then also, you know, they might spike off and tell a story that nobody else has talked about that right. doesn't necessarily fit in the same way. Totally. I think um, I think having an amazing editor is, is a starting point. I think Michael Mahaffey, who was a lead editor on the project, is one of the best editors that, that um, I've been fortunate to work with. He's, he's an incredible mind. And Pete Scott, our showrunner and, and uh, co-writer, as long as myself, um, another great mind. The overall team was just fantastic, right? I think that's that's a great starting point. But I also think as a, as a director and, and as the person helming the project, I think it's important to um, at least for me to really have a clear vision, right? And that vision is going to move. It's going to shake left, it's going to shake right naturally, like any documentary. But having the core vision of like, this is what everyone is moving towards. You know what I mean? We're not moving towards a biopic or a movie doc or a music doc. We're moving towards a cultural statement. So if everybody can keep that in the back of their mind and really think about, all right, what, how do we thread this? So that's the common focus and that's always the focus that kind of kept us on the right track because there's so much to the story, right? There's so much that didn't make it in that's part of the story. But I don't, it was always coming down to the conversation of, I don't care about the minutia of all these little things that happened. I care about how, what this story says about the culture and the world, right? So I think that naturally provides a filter for everyone to kind of distill, distill the information into. Yeah. Did you always have the idea of, of the type of narrative that you wanted to have within each of these three chapters and, and what that was going to look like? Or was that something that you really found as you went? No, that, that was one of the things that, that actually I had in the original outlines was, uh, and the episodes are titled, uh, I think they're, they'll probably have it on the Showtime thing, but Identity, Power, and Truth. And, the, and that's, those are the, 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 the three-part evolution of kind of the story is the first one is the, the manufactured human finding their identity. And then the second one is that manufactured human finding power with that identity. And then the third is really that manufactured human having to reconcile their reality and their truth and, you know, manipulate or come to terms with their truth as a manufactured celebrity. So I was kind of, that was the purpose. And then the inner beats between each one were kind of, those always take forever, but yeah. And with the subjects that you have in the film, you know, there it's it's obvious that you want to talk to his partner. It's obvious that you want to talk to a lot of his friends and, and people that he associated with in, in business. But I also thought there were some really great unexpected moments, like the fact that you interview his hairdresser actually told right. us a lot within itself. So what was that journey of finding and figuring out what some of those unexpected subjects would be that would really add to the narrative for you? Uh, the journey in finding them, you're saying? And figuring out who who it would be in his life and his world that you mm-hmm. wanted to draw in in that way. Right. Yeah. I think it was, it was really looking at, it was interesting because, you know, as, as, as this project, it was such a stark difference in the type of people that we reached out to. There were people that had wanted nothing to do with it. And then there were people that wanted everything to do with it. Like, no, I was the one who told them this and I was the one who created this idea and that idea. And it's like, it was all my idea. So I think it was really about figuring out, and this is why the, the, the conversations up front were really important was like figuring out, okay, who, like actually makes sense, right? For this project, like who, who, who is objective and not going to just come on there and be critical for the sake of being critical, not somebody who's going to be glorifying him for the sake of being glorified, who's somebody who's actually close to the story and makes sense. And I think uh, Rebecca Fay or his hairdresser made a lot of sense. Like she created his look for him. And I think he is rainbow hair, like that, like she created that look. So I felt like a natural person to speak with. And um and she made she loves him and to this day she loves him right and so i think there's just there's so much complexity to these people that we spoke to and i think it was about finding the right the right people to make it happen yeah and with that idea of you know people that loved him and and still do you really explore that in the final chapter where you know he's come out of jail now he's gone through house arrest and he started releasing music again and the industry at large is kind of done with him for at least the moment but his fans are still very connected and, and still invested in his music and there's still that connectivity. Did you always know that that, that was kind of narratively where it was gonna end and, and where you were gonna bookend the, the chapters? Um, somewhat, yeah. I think, I think the, the fans being connected to him idea, um, you know, I think that, that he has his fan base, but I think the larger point in three is that 
he's no longer becoming this super fascinating, riveting cultural figure um, that uh, that once was. You know what I mean? I think that the the fascination has has faded in a way. Um, he's no longer this person that captures our attention the same way he did when he first came on the scene. We're a little bit desensitized, but he still has his core fan base, and it's very similar to Trump. People who like Trump, who loved, sorry, people who love Trump, still love Trump. But the general populace is a little bit like, all right, cool. Like I'm kind of over him and his antics, like whatever. It's kind of irrelevant. And I think it's the same supervillain cycle for six nine. You know, and I think that's the larger point that 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 I hope comes across, which is like these supervillains, it's a cycle. There's a total cycle that exists. And we mapped out Trump's timeline, we mapped out the Joker's timeline, we mapped out six nine's timeline. And there's really that's how those elements were born. There really are these commonalities that exist and it's fascinating. Right. And I wanted to talk about exactly that within the film and the fact that, you know, you pull footage from Trump, you pull footage from a lot of these movies with villains. And then you have that, that kind of like really interesting literal, here's the scientific building of a supervillain. Here's the elements that come into play and that structure with, you know, building a little superhero yeah. slash supervillain doll as well. Um, where was the idea even just visually to, to have that element of storytelling in the way that you really felt that it was going to enhance the movie by breaking to that throughout the series? Yeah, I think uh, for me, it was, you know, taking the idea that this project was about manufactured celebrity, right? And that's the big, big idea. And then it's like, okay, cool. Well, here's a very um, jarring, ridiculous character, which lends to a jarring, ridiculous, left field, abstract, visual motif, right? So if the idea was manufactured celebrity, and he's hyper calculated, I thought it would be fascinating to have the whole thing take place in this lab where that manufactured celebrity is put together over the course of the show and takes different forms over the course of the course of the show. And it's not just like swashed together by lab hands, like every movement, camera move, swipe, turn, transition is so calculated to the frame. And I think it was really an opportunity to reflect his, his kind of creation of self. Like everything was so perfectly engineered, whether it looks like, oh, he's in the background of a concert, it's blurry. Like he did that on purpose, right? Like, and I think that's what the manufactured celebrity like interstitial elements of a supervillain were designed to do is give you the feeling of what and the level of precision that goes into creating celebrity in today's world. Mm -hmm. And you've said how you, you know, you knew that he was a mastermind of social media and celebrity, but even in making this that you were really surprised at just the minutia of what he understood. What were, what were the elements of the way that he really knew how to manipulate social media and celebrity that you maybe hadn't anticipated before making the project that you discovered? I think it was, it was interesting to, to, to see, um, he was, he, from, from speaking with everybody and hearing stories that some made it in and some didn't, here was someone who was a fundamentally very, very insecure person who was able to project um, a very secure, confident, and bold persona online. And I think that was really something that I found fascinating. And I think, it, you know, his ability to push people's buttons, like to understand what would elicit a reaction, right? I think that was another thing that was probably actually the biggest thing is like, this guy was able to poke buttons and do things and post things and comment things and the littlest things that would make everybody so angry. And I don't think anyone has seen that before. Like in terms of hip hop beefs, like people have seen the 50 cent Kanye stuff, like really aggravating and poking shit, but nothing to this scale where he was so, like a master at being a provocateur. Like we had no one seen that, you know? And I think that was something that was, I was shocked to really kind of dive into on a deep level. Yeah. And with that idea of him being an insecure person who is, who is projecting in that way, there's that really great piece of footage that, you know, he posted himself on social media when he's out on house arrest, he's released his song. It's gone to number one and he's just spewing at the camera and you see his spit right. flying and you see the insecurity underneath what he's projecting mm -hmm. in that moment. Yeah. What was, what was the journey of even just going through a lot of his social media and starting to find the pieces that actually had that element of truth that like once you looked at it with that lens in mind with the film that you were making, that it really, really showcased elements like that inside of him that were there all along? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think that, that it was, that was a fascinating process. And I think what clicked in my head during that whole time was, was the Donald Trump of it all. It was like the guy dancing on stage, everything's great, riling people up, going crazy. When see underneath all that is a dude who's deeply troubled 
by the impending lawsuits or the impending trouble that's happening or the, the maybe if there's guilt that exists, but you know, there was a real similarity with the level of bravado that Takashi and Trump carried. And underneath that bravado was a frail, fragile human being. And uh, that was just fascinating to see, right? Because I think with the Trump of it all, you're, you're able to kind of see it now more than ever, especially with him kind of like pulling for strings towards the end of his time in office. And I think with Takashi, it's like, as, you know, as he came out of jail, he's pulling everything he could to try to maintain that buzz, right? But it, it, it kind of just, the wheel stopped spinning, right? And I think you saw that with Trump and you saw that with Takashi and it was kind of just like, holy shit, like this is not, this Takashi thing is, is, is not just like one dude that's like a random guy that popped up. This is a, this is a common, this idea of supervillain is a common idea. It exists in politics. It exists in the fantastical world of actual supervillains like the Joker. And it exists in pop culture with Takashi. And more of them are going to pop up. Yeah. And there's kind of like the obvious gift when you're telling a story like this and, and you're creating that larger narrative about fame and social media with the fact that Takashi posted so much of himself online right. and through social media. Um, and so I wanted to ask you a little bit about working with your research team in terms of just starting to go through all of that footage and kind of categorizing it out and then finding the bits that were really going to enhance the narrative that you wanted to be telling, that you wanted to take into the film. Yeah, I think we had an, an, an awesome archival team. I think uh, Julianne Galdamas at, at Lightbox was, was amazing. And, and just the overall team, Anna Pittman, one of our producers was fantastic. And I think, um, you know, I think it, there was just so much material out there because this guy put his life on social media. But for us, it was like, that's great. And that helps you get the baseline narrative. But where can we find the humanity in this person pre- super villain or at least during those early stages and we were actually um, able to find um, one of his early videographers which is how we got all that footage of him as a teenager which no one's ever seen before and I think that paints a real clear picture of this was a traumatized human being trying to find self trying to find identity clawing at fame to get out of their unfortunate reality and you see that in that footage you see a person that is like doing anything and everything they can to just get attention right and, um, you know, that came from just conversations and, and earning the trust and letting that person know who gave us the footage, like, this is what we're using it for. This is not, you know, this is not some like glorification project or overly salacious thing. This is just like, we're trying to paint the picture of what this means for our culture. And your footage is a key part of that, so. And one of the other elements of previously unseen footage that you have are the inter the audio of the interviews with him when he's under house arrest. Um, and so, you know, especially given that he wasn't involved in the making of this project, how did you manage to get access to that? Uh, our production, my production team was able to secure tapes um, of an interview um, shortly after uh, he was released from prison. Um, those inter that interview is supposed to be used for a different, um, I'm not sure of all the details, but it was supposed to be used for something else. And we actually were able to get the, the tapes and, and no one's ever heard them before. It's a very vulnerable time um, and a very vulnerable version of him. Um, so yeah, we were able to, we were able to get those and, and it, yeah, it paints a very, very fascinating picture of this human being. Mm -hmm. I also thought that the the choices that you made in how you approached the, his trial was quite interesting because at the end of the day, you could have made a three hour series that really focused on the ins and the outs and the minutiae of that trial alone. Um, and you really thought very concisely about what are the elements that are going to be the most vital to the story that I want to tell in this moment. So how did you take like the gargantuan amount of information, of transcripts, of footage, you know, stories that people had to tell about that particular time and really think about boiling it down to a few scenes within that final episode? I, I think it just comes back to the purpose, right? That, that, that I kind of instilled in the team and that we all kind of agreed on was the vision for the project, which was this is not, um, this is not a project about Takashi Six Nine. This is not a biopic. This is not someone who deserves a music documentary. This is a project that needs to take his story and use the key moments in his story to launch larger conversations whether those conversations are about us, whether those conversations are about the people who exist on these platforms, or those conversations are about propaganda and the tools that exist with supervillains, it's a much larger conversation. So I think when you have that as your core driving force as a creative team, myself and everybody involved, 
that allows you to, to, to take an event like the courts situation and say, how much of this advances that initiative? If that's the core initiative is to make something about the culture, how much of this minutia is gonna advance that? Or is that minutia just gonna play into like bottom of the barrel shock factor stuff? And we didn't wanna do that. You know what I mean? That's what all everyone else can do. Like we wanted to, we want to spark conversation. We want people to feel happy, to feel sad, to feel com complex emotions about the story and to think about, oh my God, I'm absorbing all this stuff. You know what I mean? Like I'm complicit in this. So that was, as long as that was the goal, it, it was, that actually wasn't too difficult. <laughs> And overall, in, in making the film, what did you find were the biggest challenges or obstacles that you faced that were different to projects that you've worked on before with this one? I think that the, the biggest thing for me was, uh, was making sure that, uh, was making sure that we were very sensitive to the people that he affected. I think that this guy has been a wrecking ball through a lot of both personal from the, the industry, everything, the culture in general. I think it was just making sure that there was, a, there was a constant sensitivity to everything, right? From the from women who may have suffered from similar, similar domestic abuse um, in their lives, right? From people who may have felt that they lost family members that are now in prison for a long time from making sure that we're humanizing these quote unquote gang members and they're humans with that are real, that were good people. They're making sure that we are taking a look at how race applies to all of this, right? Like there's just so much sensitivity and tiptoeing around a lot of these, these topics of the story is like, this wasn't one guy who just was like a financial fraudster who embezzled money. And that was the only thing he did wrong. Like there were a lot of things that happened that are like, very sensitive topic. So I think just maintaining sensitivity and empathy, you know, and I think just, just making sure that we, we were thinking about how people are going to watch this when his, the mother of his children watches this, we want her to feel like this was, this finally did my story justice. And thank God, because there's could be a young girl out there who this is happening to them. And I want them to see like the, how this monster is born and maybe watch this and realize, Oh my God, like I'm going down this path, you know? Um, so yeah, the sensitivity for sure. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a really wonderful series that you and the rest of the team have, have managed to capture and, and thank you so much for taking time to talk all about it with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.